So I think also in, in both cases, uh, people whose partnerships we, we value, <laughs> because they, uh, um, they have, uh, both of your organizations have given us a, a platform to, um, to be critical many times on all of this, this on, on the, the management of some of these narratives, but also at accessing very important data mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, the facilitation of clandestine migration and how that occurs on the ground and from the perspective of those behind them. So without any further ado, I'll give the floor to Simona. Thank you. Grazie, thank you, Gabriella, and good uh, afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. As uh, Dragos uh, highlighted this morning, it is, um, it is always very important uh, to be able to have a structured and continued dialogue with all the stakeholders that are involved in, the, in, this, uh, in this complex uh, policy field. And by that I mean academia, civil society, practitioners, uh, and, and many others that might or might not be uh, together in this room. But the, we, we, we equally uh, appreciate this, uh, this cooperation. So um, I would have started my remarks to the, to the um, um, presentations of this panel by highlighting something that is, however, been uh, repeatedly said, so I will not dwell on, on, on to it. But, but briefly, I think, I think the, that, uh, that the main takeaway is really that there's no doubt that migrant smuggling is such a complex and such a diverse phenomenon that might make um, sometimes even little sense to speak of migrant smuggling as one size fit all uh, type of crime even. It is a type of crime. We have an internal definition, uh, an international definition. We have a, U a EU. Uh, definition, although we want to stress, and going back to your uh, point on, on, on semantics and on being very clear, facilitation of irregular migration, so not facilitation of migration, which per se is not a crime, but facilitation of unauthorized entry, stay, and residency into, into uh, entry, stay, and transit into a territory, is something different than migrant smuggling. So we have a new definition that defines something that's yet different from migrant smuggling, although complementary. Uh, but then we have national definition, national ways in which this is transposed into law. So all of it really plays already an important part uh, in our discussion. As much as the fact that the cultural, the geographical, the socioeconomic context uh, of uh, those countries and those regions where smuggling takes place, where smuggling begins, uh, transit and ends, uh, um, are also very different uh, within Europe and especially, I would say, within the countries of transit and origin. And so this is uh, very much uh, something that we, that we consider in our policy uh, legal f and legal framework, and that uh, I think our communication, if one lesson can be learned from today's, uh, today's event, is also uh, should be able to stress more and, and to, 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 get, to ensure that this message comes across in a more clear way. Um, I would like to recall very briefly uh, what we have in terms of policy framework to address this phenomenon. In 2015, we put in place this first ever EU-wide action plan on migrant smuggling. It's a five years uh, operational action plan uh, that looks look at priorities. It identified four main priorities, and under each of these priority, a number of uh, concrete again, priority, let's say, uh, key actions that should be delivered. And we identified time frame for these actions, and we identified partners uh, with whom we are working. And if I look at this action plan and at these four priorities, I do realize that the approach we had set out is quite comprehensive. And this, I, to me, resonates very much with what we have been discussing. We said, okay, we need to in enhance investigation and prosecution, but we need to enhance also intelligence and information sharing, collection, so gathering, sharing, and an analysis of this information. We need to, uh, very importantly, focus on prevention of migrant smuggling and also addressing the vulnerabilities of those who are smuggled. These are not victims, per se. There's not, it's not like under a tra trafficking in human beings framework where 
where those who are trafficked are indeed victims of such crime, but smuggled migrants can increasingly be exposed to violence, torture, and all sorts of, of crime, and, and this is something that we must be able to recognize. And fourth, uh, last but really not least in terms of relevance, the partnership with the third country. So I would like to focus a little bit more on this because I believe that this is what we have mostly addressed uh, in the panel. And when we, we chose to identify the partnership with third country as a self-standing priority in our action plan, but in fact, it is something that is relevant for the other three priorities as well. You cannot have good investigation and prosecution if you don't partner with these countries because this is an inherently cross-border form of crime. You cannot meaningfully share information and collect information if you don't agree on standards, uh, if you don't agree on secure platform, if you don't agree on how to deal with also together with countries of origin and transit, because indeed the prosecution is at the end of the day based on information that must be collected according to certain standards that fit the criminal law and procedures of the country that withheld, that, that has jurisdiction over and that in the end will prosecute. Um, and of course, even more so, you cannot prevent this form of crime if you don't partner with the countries where migrants initially uh, suffer, either as protection seekers internationally or as migrants trying to uh, go abroad to look for, for better life perspective. So it's really, I would say, but, but because it's so important for us, we highlight it as a self-standing priority in itself. Now, to give you some example, of what we are doing with third countries um, to recognize really that the context in which smuggling is born and, 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 and unfold in these countries is, is very different. We have political dialogue, we have enhanced political dialogue, we have a number of regional processes that you might be familiar with. We have the Khartoum process, the Rabat process, the Valletta action process and ensuring action plan. And there's been indeed a mushrooming of these uh, attempts to regionalize and to bring, as an EU, to bring the dialogue with the countries into a regional perspective that would also foster dialogues within the, these countries at regional level, which is not to take for granted uh, in, many, in many cases, as it wasn't to ta be taken for granted in the EU. As such, uh, we have uh, ensuring from this political dialogue a number of very concrete, I would say almost operational uh, cooperation uh, endeavor. For example, we have set up uh, joint investigation teams. It's a quite extreme form of cooperation where the buy-in, where the complete acceptance and, uh, acceptance and I would say even proactive request from the country that receive uh, law enforcement uh, and judicial authorities from European or other African countries to work together must be complete because there's no way that a law enforcement system of a country can uh, accept and can meaningfully cooperate with, with those others without uh, sharing objectives and without sharing um, uh, procedures. So we are quite quite happy and proud to see that, that this is uh, namely now working in Niger and this is one of those JIT, we call them, joint investigation teams that are supported by the EU, but is by no means the only such um, um, in, uh, instance. Where there, is, there have been a lot of bilateral such uh, endeavors, uh, for example, between Spain and other North African countries or West African countries in the past. And we're trying to explore how to uh, transfer this uh, ra so far rather successful initiative in our understanding, but also in the understanding of the Nigerian authorities and the international organization with whom we work into other countries respecting their a specific capability and context. To this extent, we have launched uh, a call for grants for North African countries, for member states uh, in the EU were asked to get together and, and, and uh, identify possibilities for setting up law enforcement cooperation, for example, with Tunisia. Um, in the same call, they had the possibility to also look at either Egypt or Morocco, so one of these three countries, and the call has been recently um, the deadline has been least recently uh, enlarged or postponed, and so I believe that we will now have it 
uh, for the end of June or beginning of July, so, so really in the summer. We also have um, information campaigns. Uh, we, 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 we partner, we have there again put on the, on, on the table quite significant amount of, of uh, resources, financial resources, open a call for grants for a number of uh, civil society organizations as well as international organizations to carry out this action. We are already carrying out a number of information campaigns in Bangladesh, in Nigeria, but also in Afghanistan, which was mentioned before um, by the colleague. And I, it, what we are doing there is very much resonating with, with your, with your uh, description of the, the complex layers around smuggling in the country and how, how the, the, those who are smuggled, the prospective migrants, understand their relationship with the smugglers. So it's really very much focusing on community and micro-community. We very much focus on uh, raising awareness through in-depth uh, theater, um, theater event in villages where this is pretty much the only thing that happens for, for months. Um, and, and working with people that are embedded in the community. So very, we try to have very innovative approaches that adapt to the context. And finally, last thing I wanted to mention, and I mind, be mindful of time, is also that we are working with a number of West African countries, namely, uh, I believe right now we have Côte d'Ivoire, uh, so Ivory Coast, Guinea um, and Ghana, and uh, as well as ECOWAS, recognizing the important dimension of, of freedom of movement in the region, uh, to, to assess together with them what are their gaps and what are the needs that they face in terms of legal framework, do they comply or not with the UN protocol, which is the basis for the EU to engage in this type of law enforcement and judicial cooperation, do they have uh, a viable institutional framework? Do they have uh, cooperation among services in the country that ensure that migrant smuggling is well understood, is prevented, and is tackled in a way that is compliant with the human rights uh, standard and humanitarian approach? So um, in, in very few words, to highlight that we take the cooperation with third countries as one of the pillars of our action to, to tackle smuggling, and that I believe the array of, of means that we're trying to put on, on the table is quite wide. And I, and I could go on, but I, I choose not to. And I, in case, am uh, happy to reply to any uh, question you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Simona. And thank you for reminding us of all of this, this issue of the, how the third court country's cooperation is, uh, um, is an essential part of um, enforcement activities. Um, and so next we go with uh, Panagiotis Malamedu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriella. Uh, yeah, and I have to say that it's also an honor and a very great pleasure for me to sit here on this panel with uh, Gabriella and uh, Simona, uh, who are representing, uh, I would say, uh, um, partners of UNODC, uh, the European Union. Uh, I mean, we have been. Uh, uh, working uh, together uh, since uh, a long time in uh, fighting against uh, uh, or uh, looking into the phenomenon of migrant smuggling and uh, recently we have uh, engaged with uh, Migration Policy Center uh, Gabriella and her colleagues in a very, very uh, fruitful uh, and productive, uh, I would say, uh, partnership uh, which uh, we hope that uh, will continue because it is very helpful also for us, as, as we said since the beginning, to have, uh, to have access at uh, this uh, type of uh, uh, reflection and knowledge uh, that is de uh, developed uh, by the researchers. So, uh, as, uh, as you uh, as said, I'm uh, working for the United Nations Office uh, on the Drugs and Crime, the section which deals particularly with uh, uh, human trafficking and uh, migrant uh, smuggling uh, uh, in Vienna. So uh, as our name, uh, the name of the office indicates, we are mostly dealing with uh, uh, the criminal aspects uh, of, uh, of migrant uh, smuggling based on the smuggling of migrants uh, protocol. Uh, that was mentioned previously uh, uh, since, uh, the, since uh, this morning. So this is a global instrument. We are not talking about the uh, European Union or uh, the relationships within uh, uh, Europe uh, and its neighbors, neighbors but uh, globally. Uh, it has uh, 146 uh, states uh, parties and uh, its objectives, the objectives of the protocol, are uh, fourfold. 
for the states that have accepted uh, to, uh, to be bound by it. Prevent the smuggling of migrants, prosecute it as a form of organized crime, protect the rights of migrants who are smuggled, and cooperate uh, to this end. Our role in UNODC is to make sure that uh, states' uh, parties in implementing uh, this uh, protocol uh, do not lose, do not lose, do not, do not lose uh, sight of any of these objectives and uh, implement them in a balanced uh, manner, I would say. Uh, um, like uh, Simona mentioned, uh, uh, it's one of the objectives of the um, action plan against migrant smuggling as well. For us, uh, therefore, sound criminal justice response to migrant smuggling is important, but uh, should be part of a comprehensive uh, approach uh, that addresses root causes of migrant smuggling and places also the protection of the rights of migrants at the core of any of any action taken uh, by states. So in developing such a comprehensive response, it is important to understand what uh, type of crime we are talking about. So I would like to go back to the to the to the definition of the protocol, make some uh, uh, observation and also addressing some of the questions that were raised uh, during the previous uh, panels. So for the protocol, uh, the focus is uh, the manifestation of uh, migrant smuggling as a form of organized crime. And this is clear because it is supplementing the United Nations Convention on Transnational Organized Crime with the main objective to encourage uh, transnational and international cooperation against uh, organized crime. I mean, we've said it enough. There is a l diversity of uh, forms uh, that the migrant smuggling uh, can uh, take. Uh, we've talk, talked about the use of the world uh, networks, uh, which does not uh, very often uh, uh, reflect uh, the reality in terms of a uh, hierarchical mafia type, uh, mafia like uh, structure. We also in UNODC see more and more uh, organi structure that are, you know, like cells that are more loosely connected uh, uh, in order to facilitate. Uh, the journeys uh, of, uh, of smuggled migrants from one point uh, of departure to the country of destination. Uh, but that said, uh, the state's parties in the smuggling of migrants uh, protocol uh, are, uh, required, are required to address uh, this uh, situation uh, as, uh, as a manifestation of organized crime, as I said. Uh, so while we should not forget that criminalization of migrant smuggling under the protocol uh, uh, is, uh, is asked from states even when an organized criminal group is not involved. So in general, um, the procurement of illegal entry into another territory for a non-national or a non-resident uh, is uh, actually uh, needs to be established as a criminal offense by the protocol whether there is a, uh, an organized group or not. But uh, of course, the main focus of uh, these instruments is to allow uh, for uh, the provisions of the convention, the provisions on extradition, on mutual uh, legal assistance, the provision allowing law enforcement cooperation uh, between states at a global level beyond any uh, bilateral uh, treaties that very often do not exist. Uh, and also provisions other such as uh, allowing confiscations of proceeds of crime or the establishment of a joint uh, investigation uh, team. Uh, I said that this is actually the, the framework which allows for the, co the cooperation at a global level in order to address the multitude, the hundreds of uh, different uh, routes and itineraries uh, taken by, uh, by the, mm, the migrant smugglers. Secondly, a very important element of the definition is, uh, we mentioned it as well, is the financial or other material benefit uh, that needs to be pursued by those facilitating the smuggling of migrants. Uh, and this is something that is actually at the core of the protocol and that allows the connection to the organized uh, criminal uh, group manifestation of, uh, of uh, this, uh, this crime. So it's crucial because it, it shows that the protocol did, did not intend uh, uh, to criminalize uh, those that uh, facilitate irregular uh, entry for uh, humanitarian purposes like uh, religious or faith-based organization or uh, NGOs or those who are smuggling family members, for example, 
uh, to allow family reunification without seeking profit. So this is not this is this type of situations are not addressed by the protocol, but at the same time I would say that are not either uh, prohibited. So legally speaking, technically speaking, uh, a country who would adopt uh, a, a provision criminalizing facilitation of irregular entry without reference to the financial or material benefit would not be in breach of its, inter its international obligations under the protocol. Uh, that, said, uh, that said, of course, strategically and uh, in terms of target targeting uh, the, the organized uh, criminal groups, uh, we advocate, of course, uh, in UNDC for the inclusion of the material or other financial uh, benefit into the definition of uh, migrant uh, smuggling, also to avoid, to avoid specifically uh, the, um, the prosecution and the criminalization of those who are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, whose motive are uh, humanitarian, uh, I would, humanitarian uh, uh, I would say, approaches uh, to the crossing uh, of uh, borders. This is very clear. I mean, this was actually the intention of the drafters. It was expressed in the official documents accompanying the, the protocol, the fact that uh, the protocol does not intend to criminalize uh, this type of uh, situation. Third, thirdly, and uh, I will close uh, with that, I would say, uh, what about uh, the humanitarian uh, exemption uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, in, uh, this uh, entire debate and uh, in particular uh, in relation to, to the protection of uh, the smuggled migrants and the assistance uh, to be provided to them? For us in UNODC, I would say anything that uh, could uh, save lives uh, or uh, ensure uh, uh, safety uh, and uh, assistance uh, to the smuggled migrants, in particular to those who are facing great risks uh, or uh, dangers, uh, is commendable and uh, uh, needs uh, to be included uh, in uh, the, the responses. As such, although there is no clear obligation in the protocol to include a humanitarian exemption, I would say, this is something that uh, you know, the see would I strongly encourage and uh, I'm happy to hear that as uh, Thomas mentioned, uh, this is uh, an approach taken from uh, uh, more and more states. At the same time, we also do believe that uh, states should uh, prioritize and focus on those forms of uh, smuggling that are the most uh, dangerous and uh, risky for the smuggled migrants uh, as those mentioned in the protocol itself under uh, the section on aggravating circumstances, meaning those that uh, subject uh, uh, migrants to inhumane or degrading treatment or pose a great uh, risk to their lives. This is actually where the focus should be together with uh, those uh, uh, organized uh, groups uh, that uh, uh, or uh, smugglers that uh, only look at uh, maximizing their profits. So. Thank you, Gabriel. I'm very happy to take any question. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nakis, for, for you know, closing with, with the fact that we are all very much concerned. You know, at, at the, the core of all of our discussions, you know, all the back and forth, it's always the, the safety of those who, who travel. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, so if Lena can assist all of us with them, please just raise your hand, and we'll take several questions, and then we'll, you know, we'll go with them. So there's one. Make sure that you raise your hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we start? Go ahead and, yeah, we go here, and then we go at the end. And please be very specific in terms of your questions given time. Thank yeah. you so much. Um, my name is Vittorio Capici, and I'm a uh, migration trainee at the European Center for Development Policy Management, ECDPM, and a EU Africa researcher mm -hmm. at the Quakers Council for European Affairs. Um, I wanted to thank the organizers and the panelists uh, for mm -hmm. the interesting discussion. Um, to keep it short, um, I would like to ask two questions, if that was possible, um, uh, to Ms. Ardovino and um, to Ms. Majidi, who I don't know if she's still in the room. Yes, okay. She's um, back there. <laughs> uh, first, uh, to Ms. Ardovino, uh, the question is with regards uh, to uh, these uh, regional partnerships. 
Um, you talked about uh, prevention of migrant smuggling in the context of uh, these regional partnerships. Um, um, as part of my research on the Khartoum process in, sp in specific, I um, encountered um, the problem of, um, um, of talking about prevention of migrant smuggling in the sense that um, don't the question would be, don't you think that cooperating with such countries, in the Horn of Africa especially, which have uh, very terrible human rights records, um, and giving them legitimacy in this uh, political cooperation um, makes um, human smuggling uh, in the end um, um, quite um, uh, probably the only way for people to, to escape uh, these countries. Um, so I don't know if you, if, if you got the question, but the thing th that uh, these countries have really poor human rights records and the EU cooperating with such country doesn't make human smuggling uh, as such inevitable for, for the people. Thank um, you. Well, we need to, you know, we, I'm sorry th okay. to cut your question, but let's give the, the microphone to other people really quick. Thank you. Okay, just so that we can get as many as we can in the room. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question to, to Takis, or let's say two uh, questions. The first one is how much these interpretative notes, uh, let's say, connected to the UN protocol on smuggling, are uh, advertised, uh, uh, disseminated. So, how much member states, UN member states, know their existence and that, for instance, they contain this explanation about the humanitarian assistance and it should be exempted? Since it's, it's in the discourse, but I don't know how much you know state authorities are aware. The second question, Article 6.4. This uh, nothing prevents states to you know, introduce more stringent provisions. Uh, do you keep track of state practices, domestic policies, which mm -hmm. are stricter than the standard in the protocol mm -hmm. or not? Thank you. Thank you so much. We go to the back to Julian. Uh, two quick questions and comments for the two uh, discussions. The first one is about, uh, we are always talking about um, cooperation and partnerships with third countries. And I was wondering, um, I mean, from my interview and field work, I never heard about cooperation from uh, the point of view, the local point of view. I mean, from the policeman to the ministry, people just always say, okay, there is a very good cooperation between the EU, the IOM, the UN ODC, but we are not asked to cooperate, but we do have to. If we want to get the money of the European uh, Fund for Development or any kind of head, we do have to cooperate. And we are told to. We are t uh, and, and so do you take this into account uh, in, in, your, in your policies, recommendations, and so on, that from the local point of view, they have no choice to cooperate? Or that is the view, that is the view of, of, uh, of the people working for the state, the police, and so on, at least in Africa. And the second question is, I'm always interested when, when, when we say that, okay, if people act as smugglers, but in a humanitarian point of, uh, in a humanitarian way, that's fine. There should not, uh, there should not be prosecution and so on. So, and the point is, if they do this for free, it's fine. And I thought we should propose to all the people working for the UN in Africa, for instance, to work for free if they really want to help people over there, and we'll see what would happen. We have for one more question. There was there was somebody you know before then. Would you like to go ahead? No, actually, I'm sorry. Let me let's yeah. let's leave you know give room to the people who haven't had a chance to ask a question. Please yeah. go right ahead. François Bienfait from EASO, European Asylum Support Office. Uh, just a question. After I saw yesterday on TV on the French TV, they were discussing about the new law on immigration. And on this ex exception, uh, humanitarian exception, they were then adding that there would be an exception to the exception when it's uh, uh, organized for political reasons. I don't know if you follow me. What, what are you saying about that? So I think we have enough questions by now. And you know, again, the issue is time. So let's go ahead and give the floor to our panelists. And Nassim, if you would like to come to the front, it will be All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I understand I have to be brief. 
but uh, the first question is indeed the difficulty uh, uh, of cooperating with uh, with countries with uh, with uh, authoritarian regimes sometimes or where human rights violations are um, are reported this is third countries but unfortunately not necessarily at least for when it comes to some human rights violation uh, only third countries. So it's, uh, I would say, a broader issue that, that it's encompassing any form of cooperation uh, internationally, not just the one on, on, on smuggling. Um, we do believe that, that prevention of smuggling is, is, uh, is key and is very important and that the, 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 pu the purpose of these regional processes is precisely to offset some of those risks and make sure that countries can talk to each other and then we have a a deeper understanding, knowledge, and data about what is happening in those countries to fine tune our cooperation. Um, um, and as Dragos said this morning, and I can only repeat it, the importance of, we, we cannot, we can never consider the smuggling should be the main, the, the, the tool uh, that people, protection seekers or, or, or economic migrants or however you want to find people on the mood should have to resort to in order to, to move. There must be other uh, mechanisms and channels. These are not within our policy realm, but, but our colleagues uh, 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 do, and we work very much together so as to ensure that uh, resettlement, relocation, access to protection is, is enforced. So I think that the two must go in parallel, and this shouldn't mean that, that uh, smuggling um, uh, criminal shouldn't, shouldn't be um, tackled, but definitely that something else must happen in order to ensure that those who need to flee a country can do so. Um, and in that respect, I wanted just to stress that, yes, uh, Europol uh, latest press releases, I don't know if any of you is informed about those, as well as our uh, member states, are not as much publicized as other side of things, but they've shown a, a very rapid increase in targeting high-level target. There's always a financial component behind it, it's very clear. These are clearly networks uh, where there are sometimes jihad components or sometimes uh, uh, components that look at uh, policy criminality between arm trafficking and drug trafficking so I think that we have to make an effort to communicate also those successes uh, more um, and to, to provide the, the sense that we are uh, caring for the security of migrants and citizens alike because at the end of the day this is this is the, the real issue um, there is also an important aspect that, yes, our country forced to cooperate. Well, I believe the recent task force between the EU, the UN, and the African Union that was set up last year in December uh, in Abidjan, and then that uh, was followed up through a large conference in Niamey, showed that uh, African countries themselves, for probably the first time in some, in, in some uh, took ownership of the fact that their own citizens are dying in and an suffering uh, an, an, uh, despicable human rights violation, very gross human rights violation. And that's not the only a European issue. It's an African issue. It's an issue for the world. And this task force is very, very important for us. It tackles work in Libya, but not only. And I believe it shows that irrespective of the development cooperation that it's still ongoing, this is a priority no matter what for such countries. So I would invite you to read the declaration on smuggling and trafficking that was adopted in Yemen in that uh, in that respect. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I covered everything, but I know we are yeah, pressed on time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. On the last point, uh, I would uh, definitely agree. Ah, France, France. Ah, yes. I'll do it later. I, l I, I let... No, no, go, go, go. I mean, I have not started yet. You go, go, go. Uh, You ask about the French, the French project. Well, of course, uh, it's still uh, ongoing. But indeed, we look at it uh, at the, 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 the enlarging the scope of the of the humanitarian exemption to the transit element. But at the same time, making sure in a reasoning that I haven't yet uh, read in depth, but that I uh, from from skimming through looked at. Uh, endeavors to make a distinction, to draw a line between what is a genuine humanitarian assistance and what is perceived as a political stance. I, I, I do not agree with the law of a state, I do not agree with a policy, and I want to uh, subvert it for reasons that I qualify as humanitarian. And the authority of a state, national states say we have a legitimate interest to control our border, and, and it's up to us, authority, judicial authorities in the end, to understand what is uh, humanitarian uh, assistance to those in distress and what is an organized activity 
to uh, help people cross borders because we believe this is the right thing to do. So I, I believe this is what the law is, is, is attempted to clarify. We will see what this will lead to, the process is ongoing, and uh, I, I admit it was from two days ago, I haven't uh, had yet the time to read it in full, but it's, I think, a testimony to the fact that, that clear clarity is needed and that even at national level there's a struggle to try to understand who defines humanitarian assistance, what is humanitarian assistance. Briefly, when we did our evaluation of the facilitators package last year, we had a, a, an, ongo a, an open consultation for three months, and we had more than 2,500 replies, and they were very diverse, and the understanding of humanitarian assistance from the respondents was overwhelmingly saving people from dying. People who are in distress in an emergency situation, people are at sea, I need to die them. It wasn't charging the phone or, or people. It, it is a very diverse understanding. So I think it, it's a debate that we need to have, and that's good that, that, that we are having. More than more, more time than uh, Simone. So, uh, <laughs> so too much. <laughs> Already so, too much. So on, uh, on uh, the point of international cooperation, I would totally agree with Simone. I mean, what lies behind decision taken uh, by states and uh, in uh, international politics, uh, we can always argue and try to, to second guess and why uh, such, uh, uh, such partnership is created or uh, such action is taken. But uh, still, uh, there, is, uh, there is also the fact that uh, uh, people uh, are dying and have been dying and uh, have been the object, uh, not only in Africa, as Simone said, but uh, elsewhere of, uh, of uh, severe abuse uh, in, in the process of smuggling. And I think that this is something that uh, uh, states uh, also take into account when they decide to engage with, uh, with others. Uh, coming to the questions of uh, Thomas and um, the interpretative notes. I mean, they are there, the states themselves accepted them. You know, there was in the context of the negotiations, they, they are included in the subsequent uh, documents uh, uh, helping states to implement uh, the protocol, like uh, the legislative guide. So, so it is there, it, and it is repeated uh, time and time again in the international forum, and uh, I can assure you that, uh, uh, you know, this as a secretariat, uh, make sure that uh, this is a reminder to the state. Because this is actually the, the, what the states themselves have declared, that our intention was not to criminalize this particular conduct, but uh, smuggling for profit, and uh, in particular as a form of uh, organized crime. That, that, said, that said, given that we have Article 6.4, uh, as you said, which is actually the one that reads a bit differently than what you said. Uh, nothing in this protocol shall prevent a state party from, take, from taking measures against a person whose conduct, against a person whose conduct constitutes an offense under its domestic law. So this, you know, this is, uh, I, I would say, a, a safeguard for the state, uh, the, way, the, the way the states uh, the, or the drafters of the protocol uh, found to to balance a little bit this uh, this situation and uh, so this this is uh, what and uh, whether we keep track or not recently we have conducted a research on a sample of 13 countries to see whether uh, states uh, and fra has participated actually simona was there on the financial or other material uh, benefit in the, in the definition it was only a sample uh, a sample study of 13 countries we saw that many of them do not include the financial or other material benefit uh, in the definition of, uh, of migrant smuggling. And this is important, I mean, le let's face it, the protocol requires, uh, it requires states to criminalize a specific conduct when it is done for uh, gaining uh, profit. When we, uh, when we call for the inclusion of the financial and other material benefit, uh, it is uh, precisely in order to ensure that the focus stays where it should be and to avoid that other actors, humanitarian actors, family members, uh, are not uh, prosecuted because, or because this, is not, this is not the aim of the protocol. It's, uh, this is not the primary aim of the protocol. The aim is to target the organized group and those who are putting uh, the most risk and the most uh, dangers uh, uh, in the course uh, of the journey. At the same time, I wouldn't say that, I would also say that opportunistic operators, you know, operating or facilitating uh, uh, smuggling at a very, very low level should, should also not be, I mean, th they are criminalized and uh, 
uh, according to the protocol and uh, the, the obligations of the state should be sanctioned, but uh, there is greater interest to, to look first and prioritize uh, more other types uh, of uh, uh, prosecutions, uh, uh, I think. Thank you so much. Asim, to conclude? Maybe just some final words. I didn't get there was a question for me, but we can discuss it later. Uh, yeah. um, just one word and to close the loop with, with also something Julien has said. I mean, there are some practices that are happening and will continue to happen and that are not really within states control or states capacity to control. And if states do interfere, they often like in West Africa end up making the situation worse. But there was one point mentioned on the role of officials, border authorities, those who are the legal representatives, the state representatives at the level where migrants are. And whether you look at Kenya, Somalia, East Africa, West Africa, or Europe, many of the protection which issues we see are caused by border officials, by state officials who don't necessarily know the text, the AU framework, uh, the, free com uh, the common protocol and free movement of people, whether it's in West or East Africa. I mean, these texts, we know them, we can discuss them, they don't trickle down to the local level. So the fragmentation of knowledge mm -hmm. of state practices and what on this side, we're accountable to do and that we don't do, I think I would be interested to seeing more discussions around that uh, than necessarily on trying to control something that we can't control, being the smuggling practices um, that are informal that will stay there. Um, but there's a lot more that states should be doing to ensure the protection of migrants. Uh, Thank you so much for everything. And thank you to our panelists. So uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Do you want to say anything? And I think with that, um, we would conclude our event for the day. Thank you so much for being here today. As you can see, there is so much more that we can, uh, that we can say in part of a, a, a conversation that, that I, but I hope we really take um, you know, that, that we push because it, there's, a, there's a lot that we can learn from, from this kind of, this level of interactions and exchanges that we are starting to have. Um, for me, for example, coming from a completely, again, different, different context, building this collaboration with, with SEPS, with UNODC, with DG Home has been, has been central at, at reframing and helping me understand other aspects of the facilitation that until now I had really not incorporated, given the fact that my work has been primarily field work based. So thank you to, to all of the partners that are here today for helping us and, and assisting us also in you know, bridging these this gaps that are very wide mm -hmm, and that, mean that, that need to be addressed and that need to be discussed you know, you know, out here you know, with, with everybody in the same room and together. Just very briefly, I mean, this was Gabriela's idea. Uh, so I just wanted to thank her um, really very much for, for this opportunity to bring you know, forces uh, together and complementarity, and also to our colleagues at the NPC, Ogeli, and also Lina for, for the organization. I think there's a lot of things uh, uh, which have been highlighted today of uh, central uh, importance, and perhaps uh, one of them is uh, that this affects everyone in society that this is not just an issue affecting specific uh, groups or people perceptions or imaginaries that we may have, but it really affects all citizens, non-citizens, civil society, political activists, uh, practitioners who are also expected to deliver something which is highly politicized and that they face also the challenge to deliver uh, in accordance to also their uh, ethical and uh, professional codes. And uh, there's been a lot of focus on anti-smuggling, and perhaps we should uh, lower down that politicization and really uh, have a realistic uh, <coughs> discussion about what can we really expect from this. And the Commission can do a lot of work on upholding the standards we have. And uh, you were mentioning, there was mentioned this third country cooperation, that there is not an inconsistency. When we go abroad, we use the benchmark of the EU on uh, the protocol, but actually inside the EU, uh, there is not a similar consistency check that member states are in compliance with that protocol in their daily uh, activi activities and, and, and laws. So really thanks very much to, to everyone and uh, hopefully we will have more of these kind of events uh, in Brussels as well. And big thanks to all the speakers and discussants. 
Thank you once again to, to, and to everybody who, who, has been, who has been following us out there, to Lena mm -hmm, and uh, to Julia, where is your, yeah, yeah, there, and to Orly who is outside, you know, staffing the, the front. Oh, she's like, hey, Orly. <laughs> and of course, to everybody back at the MPC in Florence, please um, look us up if you have any questions, you know, we'll be around. So, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm once again sorry that I had to cut other people, but you know, we want to get out of here before somebody comes and tells us that we need to get out. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here.